man. Now, I'm not talking about gender here. I'm, I, when I say that, it's gender neutral. Uh, when I say uh, God looking for people, he's still searching for people that will do his bidding. He's still searching for people, I believe, that, um, that, that are willing to make a decision. I think he's searching for people that are willing to uh, be a disciple, that he's searching for people that are willing to sacrifice. And uh, I want to, if I may, start at verse number 12 in Luke 14 in the New King James Version. It's going to read like this. And, but I want to lay a little bit of background before we talk about it because the first, I really want to talk to you about this great supper that the Lord's going to talk about, but I got intrigued with the paragraph before that. And so I want to share that with you first. And I won't keep you over a couple hours, I promise. So anyway, um, so Jesus said to his host in verse 12, he said, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. Now, now, I know that's contrary to the way we do things or the way we even think. But he said, when you get ready to throw a party and you're ready to have a, a big luncheon or a big dinner, don't invite all the rich cats, don't invite all your friends, don't invite your neighbors and your brothers and sisters and relatives. I know, I'm not talking about a family dinner. But, but what he's talking about, he said, because but when you give a feast, invite poor people, invite maimed people, invite lame people. Invite blind people. What he's saying is invite people that ordinarily couldn't afford to get there, and if they could afford to get there, they wouldn't be able to walk there. They, they couldn't see how to get there. And what the Lord is trying to say is when you really want to do something great in the kingdom of God, help somebody that can't help themselves. We have a wonderful, wonderful care ministry here at the church now, and Sister Robin and Sister Beth are, are heading that up, and we've got a number of people now that's willing to become a part of that, and I'm excited about that. And, um, and, and they're going, the goal of that is to help some people that can't help themselves, or at least temporarily. He said then, uh, amen, give the Lord praise for that. He says, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind, and then you'll be blessed. He says, although they cannot repay you, do you, do you get that? He says, because they cannot repay you, but you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Some of our volunteers say, well, Pastor, I ain't getting paid around here. Oh, yeah, you're getting paid good. Just not yet. All of this fades away. But, but what we're working for Listen, parking lot team, those of you who struggle out there in the cold or in the heat and whatever it is, guess what? We're working for an eternal reward. For those who are struggling with babies in the nursery and teenagers in the DSM and babies uh, back there, there's things that we're working for. He said, but if you're not careful, we work for things and we do things for people who can do us another favor or scratch our back in return. He said, but I encourage you to help somebody who cannot help you. That's one of the wonderful things about Guatemala. There ain't no way in the world them people could ever pay us back for what we've done. There ain't no way in the world they could turn around and send back what we've already sent right there. But, and we don't want them to. But here's what God does. Every single time we do something like that, I don't care if it's given to the Care Net Center there that Sister Pat works there or the women's shelter, the battered women's shelter or Missions for Camden, whatever it is, Louisiana's flood, uh, Camden's storms or whatever, whatever we give to, God seems to give back and he has a bigger hand. Amen. So um, he says, so... They can't repay you, he said, but you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So let me say this. In the next coming weeks, obviously, we're going to be asking for volunteers. We're going to ask people to serve, whether it's just one time on Easter Sunday or whether if you just get so hooked up, you say, you know what, Pastor, I, I think I could do this a week or two or a month or six months or for the rest of my life, maybe. I don't know. <clears throat> but Jesus told a parable right after this, and uh so he's told them about how they ought to act and how, what they ought to do 
when they invite people to the house, you know. And I, that's not to say that you can't ever have a, a, a dinner where you invite your friends and your relatives and all that. But Jesus, you got to understand who Jesus is talking to. And when, when he's talking to uh, pharisaical people and all that that always have their mind in one particular area, sometimes he got to give them a little something to chew on. Are you with me? Say amen. So right now he says, one of those who sat at the table heard him say this. <laughs> and he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And so then Jesus replied, now, I want you to get this because Jesus was always gnawing back and forth and just sort of popping the, the church people of the day right in the face. I mean, right in the eye. You know, they one that time they said, um, he says, then we ought to show ourselves neighborly. And one lawyer wanting to justify himself said, well, then who is my neighbor? And Jesus told the story about the man who fell among thieves on his way from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And then, you know, Jesus talks about inviting blind people and poor people and people can't afford to pay and this, that, and the other. And then somebody pipes up and says, well, when one of those at the table heard him say this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and he invited many guests. And at the time of the banquet, he sent to his servant to tell them who had been invited, come now for everything is ready. But they all alike began to make excuses, and Jesus said, or excuse me, and the first one said, I have bought a field, and i got to go see it. Please excuse me. You've heard me say this before, and I just have to say it again. Um, who buys land that they haven't looked at? It's just a fair question to me. But this guy says, um, I've bought a field, and i got to go see it. Please excuse me. I used to say this years ago, and some of you still can't get over it. I used to say, if you're going to just give me an excuse, why don't you just say, well, Pastor, I'm out of peanut butter. We say, well, what's peanut butter got to do with it? Well, it's just as good a lie as anything else. <laughs> so why don't you just say, well, I was out of peanut butter. That's why I didn't come to church. Or I was out of peanut butter, and that's why I'm not going to serve. I'm just out of peanut butter, and I'm just not going to do it. I just ain't going to stand for it, huh? <laughs> so... But he said, I bought a field and I got to go see it. I don't really believe that. How many of you, matter of fact, I got something in the mail the other day. You know, I live in the Creek Wood and some of us call it the Creek Hood and um, <laughs> subdivision there. And I've been there for a long time now, I don't know, 16 years or something. And they've uh, decided to, somebody bought all the land around us and they divided it out in quarter acre tracks. And so they sent us all a certified letter and said, hey, if you're interested, we're willing to sell uh, some property that adjoins your property and here's what we want for it and here's the percentage that we'd like and uh, you can give us a little bit down and so on and so forth and if you're interested, we're interested, whatever. But here's the thing. I wouldn't just write them a check without seeing it. And this guy says, well, y'all excuse me. He said, I bought some land and I got to go have a look at it. Has anybody here ever bought any land that you didn't go look at? Now, I understand if my great uncle died and left me something you know, and it's out in Texas, i got to go see it. Well, that's one thing. But I'm not paying my hard-earned money for something that I hadn't went and looked at. Anyway, another guy piped up and said, you know, I bought five yoke of oxen, Lord, so I'm out of peanut butter too. Huh? He said, I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Now, that's really stupid. Uh, I've never, I, I remember in um, taking economics in high school, this has been eons ago it seems, but I can remember the guy who was teaching it, he was teaching us youngsters, you know, what, some things we ought to look at when we get thinking about getting out on our own and trying to buy a car and this, that, and the other. And he showed this beautiful car, and we all was like, wow, that's, man, that thing is nice. And it had a sale price on it, and we all said, yeah, that is great. And then later on in the little, I guess it was a film strip back then, y'all excuse me for, uh, you know, those days, some of y'all don't know what a film strip is, but nonetheless... In the next little clip there, they opened the hood and it didn't have no motor. What I'm saying is I've never bought a car that I didn't test drive. I've never bought a car that I didn't go look at. And, but this guy, an automobile of this day would have been an ox or, or a mule, or, you know, a donkey. And um, he said, well, I've bought five yoke of oxen and i got to go prove them. In other words, I bought them sight unseen. 
I've never seen them pull a plow. I've never seen them yoked up. It's absurd, isn't it? He could have just said, I'm out of peanut butter, Jesus. I ain't going. So, um, so still another said, I got married recently, and I can't come. You know, because the law back then gave somebody a year. And um, he said, I, I've just gotten married, so I can't come. In other words, I'm out of peanut butter too. So the servant came back and reported this to his master, and the owner of the house quickly became angry, uh, and he ordered his servants, and he said, go out quickly and invite, go into the streets and the alleys and the towns and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Let, let me tie these two stories together, may I? Jesus had just told him, if you're going to have a big party, you really want to have a big party, a nice party, don't call your cousins and your aunts and your uncles and all of these people and the rich and all the ones with affluence and bring them over because, you know, you're kind of expecting that next year they're going to invite you and it's kind of scratch my back and I scratch yours or whatever. He said, but if you really want to do something great, Get a few friends together and go down and, you know, to the house where people are blind and bring them down here. Go get some people that can't walk. Go get some people that don't smell so good. Go, go get some of them people. He said, and now you can really feed somebody and you've done something. Well, nobody wants to do that. You know why? Because there's no, there's, what, what is that in there for me? So then he tells this story about Somebody had a big supper, a great supper. And, and this guy invited, you know, he invited everybody. And you know what? How many of you know people just do what they want to do? They do. I do, you do. For the most part, we do what we want to do. In other words, whatever we prioritize, and let me just say this, Lord, I know this. I sure know it. If you don't dictate to your calendar what you will do in your blocks of time, in the time that you've got left, your calendar will dictate it to you. Same way with your money. We'll talk about this on Sunday. If we don't name those dollars, if we don't allocate those dollars, you know what will happen? Whatever's urgent always gets what's there. If we don't say, this wedge is for this, these hours are for this. I, I, you know, just the other week, I, in fact, it was Monday. I was in the staff meeting, and uh, I, I said to our staff that was there, I said, you know what, in the Google Calendar app, I have started actually planning the day better than I have before. In other words, from 9 to 9.30, we meet and discuss the day and what's got to happen through the week. From 9.30 on Monday to 11.30, those are message preparation hours for that day. I won't take no phone calls. Not going to see anybody. But that's the time that I've got to have my nose in the book. And then, of course, there's other days of that too. But just to give you an example, and then from 1130 till 12 o'clock, Fellowship One, the tasks that are mine in Fellowship One have got to get done in that block of time. You know why? Because I've only got so many minutes left so many blocks left so many sunrises left and hey friend it ain't just me every one of us here ain't got so many blocks of time left so you can name them and what you're going to do or you can just sort of fly by the seat of your pants and whatever but God is looking for somebody that will quit making excuses and say Lord I will say this is your time this is your dollars this is what you want me to do this and I'm not out of peanut butter Amen. So he said, but we've, we've invited everybody. We, we invited the, the rich, the wealthy. We invited the statesmen. We invited this one. We invited. And he said, you know what? Everybody's got something else to do. And Jesus said, that's fine. I've still got a nice big banquet ready. Go get the halt, the lame, the maimed, the crippled. What he says is just because they ain't coming, we ain't going to cancel the banquet. Amen? Let me say this. Just because a lot of folks have fell out, he hadn't canceled heaven. He hadn't canceled his plans for the rapture just because somebody quit serving him. None of that's put on hold. That's still going to go on. So he said, sir, the servant said, um, 
what you've ordered has been done, but then there is still some room. In other words, we, we've, we've gone and got the maim, the lame, the crippled, the halt, and all that. And so he says, go out now to the roads and the county lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get to taste of my banquet. Now listen, the greatest opportunity that we have, I wish this house was slam-packed right now to say this, but the greatest opportunity we have for a loved one, cousin, aunt, uncle, or just a dear friend to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, the greatest time is in the Easter season. You don't even have to beg them to come. It's not like pulling teeth because it's all set. Somehow God just stirs the hearts of people and they're going to be more willing to give God an opportunity in the next few weeks than ever before. I want to encourage you not to make an excuse. I want to encourage you not uh, not to let those blocks of time pass you by. What, What blocks of time are you talking about, Pastor? Well, there'll be blocks of time where we're going to be serving here at the church. Some of your life groups know that. Um, There's going to be times where we're going to be doing things here. Then there's going to be cards that's printed. There's going to be invites that are given. We will mail a beautiful card to every home in Camden County. And if the Lord provides the funds, maybe even Charlton. We'll see. (laughs) Amen. So every zip code in this county. And, And I'm just believing God. How many of you believe with me? Amen. I'm believing God to see 75 people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. I'm believing God to do something awesome in this place. So, it takes work. It takes service. Here's what I've learned. That if I don't dictate my time, then just life events will. Some of you call it flying by the seat of your pants. In other words, well, what are you going to do now? I don't know. I'm just going to. You know, start the day uh, and then just go about my life. And no, we have to make some plans or you'll never. You remember what we talked about? We, this year, we started talking about goals. In fact, in the middle of Transformed right now, you should be journaling and reading your journal every day. And there should be some goals that are coming to pass right now. And if they're not coming to pass, there's only one reason. Because you haven't visited that every day. Because you have not said, well, I'm supposed to do this on this day. You just sort of went back to living how you live. So let me say this. There's a cost of being a disciple. And that's the latter part. In fact, I wasn't going to read this, but I think I will. Jesus said in verse number 26, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, Such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow after me cannot be my disciple. Now, he he did not, that that sounded pretty brutal right there when he said if he hates his mom and dad. No, no, he wasn't saying that in the sense that you and I think of hating my dad because he would forbid. We can't hate people and then say we love God. Are you with me? But what he says is we cannot place any higher priority on anything else. Y'all know my biblical priorities. God is always number one. Kelly is number two. My children are number three. And then that includes grandchildren, you understand. And the church is number four. You say, well, oh, wait a minute, Pastor. Shouldn't the church be number one? Absolutely not. Should your children be number one? Absolutely not. Why? Why couldn't my children be number one? Because God gave you them for about 18 years, maybe 20. He gave you your spouse till death you do part. Now, you might learn this coming Sunday. Well, go ahead and praise the Lord. You're going to learn this coming Sunday. It might be till debt do you part. We're going to talk about that Sunday. I'm just sort of setting the hook. But uh, because that is the number one reason people get divorced is because of money or the lack thereof. And I would submit to that it is not because of money or the lack thereof. It is because of the mismanagement of it. Amen. Whoa, I don't mean to get that far into it, but let me say this. I'll tie this up. God's looking for a man or a woman that will make a decision. Today, I was sitting in the chair right there. I mean, I was 
in fact, I was looking over at the hole in those teeth and said, man, that sure is expensive. But anyway, uh, I'm standing there. And when the doctor says, what are we going to do? I didn't even give Kelly time to say, I'm going home and we'll just do this. No, 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 no. We got you here. You're already numb. Well, was having a hard time getting her numb, but after a couple gallons of lidocaine or whatever, I don't know, they finally got her numbed up. I said, hey, let's do it while we're here. Who in the world wants to have to try to get to sleep again another night and worry about this thing? She done took two volume last night and two volume this morning, and, man, she was loopy. You know, women, that's why I won't bring her out because they ain't no telling what she'll say. <laughs> but God's looking for a man of decision. So when, when, when this guy, when the doctor asked me today, what do you want to do? I mean, you can't say, I want to tell you something. Listen to me, friends. Some of you need to understand this, especially those who like to go to dinner on Sunday and, and, and you're in my party and you can't never decide where you want to go. <laughs> I need you to understand that there is a cost of indecision. Did you hear me? There is a cost of indecision. And in your own life, in your own business, there are times where you need to make a decision. But you say, well, I'm trying to think about this, and I'm thinking about that, and I just don't know about this, and I don't know about that. Pretty soon, let me say this. If this building is on fire, there is limited amount of time to make a decision before you burn up in here. Hello? I'm throwing something through that window or going through that door. We'll worry about all that later. There is a time you have to make a decision, and so you cannot be an indecisive person. So some of you need to practice that, making a decision. You say, well, what if I make the wrong decision? Well, you know what? Then you'll learn something. Hello? It'll be a lesson that you learn, and you just chalk that up to, well, I learned something. You know, I made the wrong decision. I probably shouldn't have had my hand that close to the nail gun, and I shot the end of my finger. You won't do it no more. Ask Andrew. He'll uh, <laughs> he can tell you. But, but what I'm saying is when you make a decision, you, you let me give you a football analogy. Some of you have seen this before. You're right down on the goal line. They're only uh, inches from the goal. And do we run the ball in or do we pass the ball? And you know what happens? Here's the deal. Everybody says, man, he needs to run the ball. But then there's those people say, well, I don't know. They're expecting the run. He ought to just do a little pass and somebody else has a little bootleg or whatever. But that coach has to make a decision, and he's only got a limited number of seconds to make the decision. And if he makes the right decision, he's a hero. And if he makes the wrong decision, he's a zero. That's how it is. You're a hero or zero just like that. Now, the deal is this. Somebody's got to make the decision. So make the decision and live with the consequences. God's looking for somebody that can make a decision. So, uh, and, and give me an example of that, Pastor. Well, I'm glad you asked. Moses said, I have put before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Choose life and live. Why would you choose death to die? Uh, Elijah said, how long will you be halted between two opinions? If Baal is God, then serve Baal. He said, but if God is God, then serve God. He said, but it's time to get off this fence that you're on. Well, I want to serve God. Well, I ain't sure I still like to drink and party. Well, well I want to do this, but I, you know, I, I want to go there, but I ain't sure I want to give up all of my foolish ways. I felt that one bounce back with a small crowd. Joshua said, I don't know how y'all feel about it. He said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Brethren, let me say this to you, men of the house, men of God. You say, wait a minute, we're equal here. I'm not getting into women's rights and this and that and the other. Brethren, you're the head of your house. God created you to be that. And we are to lead. And for me and my house, we ought to say, and I have made that election, that we are going to serve the Lord. Amen. Give him praise. My kids are grown and gone now, but there wasn't no choice whether they were staying at the house playing video games. They might have had some video games, but you could guarantee when it comes church time, you go into church. Hello? Or get a whipping and still go to church. But you go into church. <laughs> As for me and my house, was God's looking for decisive people. And then he's looking for people who's got a desire. I mean, a burning passion. I've known people that were passionate about relationships. I've known people that were passionate uh, uh, about various things, but they weren't passionate about. I know people passionate about football, man. I remember when Camden was 
riding high. Y'all remember them years? I mean, a couple decades, boy. We was right there at the top. And I hope we get back there soon because I'm passionate about them wildcats. But nonetheless, I mean, I have screamed my head off Thanksgiving week. I've drove all over the state. I mean, I've been right there, right there with a bunch of y'all. I mean, we're passionate about it. It amazed me how passionate I saw people at the football field. And you couldn't even get them to say hallelujah in church. They couldn't even get the hand all the way up. But man, you get on the bleacher, son, and they will run over you and stand on somebody's shoulders. Huh? That's right. So it's not about you. Tell me you're not emotional. You are emotional. If Ed McMahon shows up at your house with about $6 million, you'll be emotional. So he's looking for somebody that has that passion and that desire. Uh, you know, uh, he's looking for somebody that has that dedication. Man, I'm so thankful for you guys here on Wednesday night when a lot of the world don't. So doing life groups, you know, some of you last night, some of you night before, some of you tomorrow, doing the things that you do, the dedication. I'm telling you, that impresses God. When we are dedicated to be in the house of the Lord, dedicated to do the work of the Lord, you say. And you know, so sometimes the least, uh, let me see if I can say this right, the people that are doing the least, in other words, they got the most time on their hands are the laziest in the kingdom of God. Let me just look straight down. <laughs> and I don't know if anybody, but some, some, sometimes folks with the least to do in life, in other words, they don't have a big agenda. I, someone told me one day, said, Pastor, if you really want to get something done, find a busy person in your life, and they will put it on the schedule, they will block out the time, and they'll get it done. So, God's looking for that kind of dedication. People that are dedicated to the plan of God, dedicated to the house of the Lord, dedicated to the man of God, dedicated. God is looking for not only people of decision and dedication but and determination. Um, he, he, yeah, he's looking for people of determination, people that says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. Paul said it like that. He says, you know, and we look at men, we see guys like Job. His wife said, won't you just curse God and die? But Job says, I've decided that I'm going to serve God till I die. He said, I have made my mind up that though I can't see him and I can't feel him and I can't touch him and I'm ate up with boils from my head to my feet, somehow God still knows where I'm at. And when he's finished trying me, I'll see him. And in the end, even if the skin worms devour this body, yet in my flesh... Will I see God, not another? And then I think about guys like Abraham who was told to get out from among your people and go to a land. Where are we going, God? I'll show you. Huh? We've got to say, I I'll show you. Don't worry about it. But just leave everything and let's go. That's a tough call. I've done it a few times in my life. Let's go. And then Paul says, and I'll tie it up right here. Somebody willing to stay the course. Somebody willing to keep the faith. Here's what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. This is actually King, King James. He says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I have kept the faith. I hope when I get old, I'm getting older, but one day I'm going to get old. Are y'all with me? Say amen. That's right. And I hope when those days come, I could join Paul in saying, I'm now ready to be offered if the, if the rapture hadn't taken place and we're still here. And the time of my departure is at hand. I hope I can say I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about the course that God laid out for me, that that God wanted me to accomplish. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is a laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. Stand with me, if you will. Amen. I never get tired of doing the work of the Lord. Amen. I ran my crazy head off this past week, and it ain't stopping, it don't look like. 
until we get back from Guatemala and I don't think it'll stop then because then we'll be about nine days from Easter and I know how that's going to be and then we're going to do Easter and then we're going to follow up on Easter and you all understand that's just what it is but I can't think of anything in the world I've spent a lot of some long Monday matter of fact I didn't leave here till 10 o'clock Monday night got here about 8 30 that morning but I don't know of anything else in the world I would rather do than kingdom work it's the only thing that's going to last Amen? It's the only thing that's going to last. We're preparing ourselves, not for this life, but for the life to come. So let me thank you for the, that that you do in the kingdom of God. Let me thank you for being a part, being that decisive person, that dedicated person, that determined person. So let me pray for you. Father, I just love you now, and I pray for the men and women that are here. And I pray, God, that, that we would be people of decision, people of determination, people of destiny, oh God. I pray, God, that you would help us to be people of desire that are passionate, oh Lord, about what you are passionate about. In other words, God, that we would be just on fire for what moves your heart, and that's lost people. Not that we forget saved people that have given their heart to the Lord. We want to encourage them they're soldiers in the army of the Lord. We want to enlist them, oh God, to complete the mission that you have. On, and, and Jesus, you came to seek and to save those who are lost. So if I'm in pursuit of you, oh God, then I must be pursuing the lost because that is why your son got up from your right hand and said, I will go and become the supreme sacrifice for men and women for the sins of this world that I might reconcile the creation of God back to the Creator. So Lord, help us to be the men and women of God that you'd have us to be. And help us to reap this harvest while it is ripe in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Remember to start thinking about Good Friday and Easter. We'll see you on Sunday.